Why's it feel so good? Hey everybody, I'm Lance Koike, and welcome to Tea Time 003. Uh, tea Time is where Allison and I sit down after generally a long day of work and talk about something. It's a little bit easier to film. We do kind of have an agenda today. We started doing this because Allison took some blood tests and she had some alarming results. Uh, so I'm gonna have her kind of outline where she was, give you the, the very short version of Tea Time 001. Feel free to watch that, link up here uh, and in the description. Feel free to watch that and then hopefully we'll get you up to speed. And it's been a few months now. I don't know how many, four, five, five, I think? Uh, it's coming around, we did it about four months ago because it was in January. Okay. Um, and the numbers are different and they're way better and I won't save that for long. Spoilers! So. <laughs> um, so excited. So yeah, where were you? Okay, so yeah, we were at, well, I was really nervous because I started out back in January. Uh, I had some blood work in December that was kind of, my cholesterol was kind of high, my triglycerides was kind of high. I knew I had a really stressful year and I came to the new year and was like, I'm gonna be so different. I'm gonna make so many changes. I'm gonna be so healthy. Watch me like be a good coach and lower all my numbers and then life happens. Yeah. And then you're like, oh yeah. So we, if you've watched episode two, you know that I've had some health problems. And so I was really nervous that with these health problems, I wasn't able to make all the changes that I wanted to, especially with school. Cause school really does take up so much of my time. So I was really concerned that it wasn't going to improve, at least as much as I had hoped. And I'm so excited because I have the results. So the last blood draw was in December. We filmed in January. But as of December 12, 08, 2021, my triglycerides were 162. As of April 2022, my triglycerides were, drum roll please, <laughs> da -da 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 -da. 71. So they got cut down more than in half. I literally cut my triglycerides down in half in, uh, it's closer to like four months. Um, but that's... <laughs> I'm very excited about this. That's great, yeah. Uh, and I think these changes are really, really not that difficult to make. Um, they definitely were harder some days than others, sure. but overall, making these changes is something that if I can do in PA school, you can do in your life. And we're gonna try to walk you through some of what those changes were. Yeah. I do wanna highlight as well, so I had some other good changes that had happened. So just reading here, my VLDLs were not high, but they did drop from 29 to 17. Those are pretty like ubiquitously bad. Yeah. And my total cholesterol is actually the same. And we're gonna talk about that just really briefly about why that's pretty important. So your total cholesterol is a combination of kind of like your LDL and your HDL. So HDL, I like to remember H is happy. LDL, I remember it as it's the loser cholesterol. You don't want high LDL. So my LDL is still a little bit high. It was at 127, now it's at like 123. So I still have some work to go. I want that ideally below 100, but it's still not a bad place to be. And the reason it's not a bad place to be is because of my HDL. So your HDL, what we were taught in school is HDL kind of complements your LDL. So if you have, and this is just kind of genetically, some people have higher H or LDLs. I definitely have that in my family to have, have high LDL cholesterol. But if your HDL is also high, it kind of helps counteract any of the negative uh, effects from the LDL. So my HDL went up, which even after meeting with the cardiologist from all my health problems, he and I talked about this. The best way to improve your HDL isn't even with diet necessarily because people talk about healthy fats. HDL actually responds really well to exercise. So if you're someone who you have really high cholesterol in your family and you're trying to make easy changes to improve your cholesterol results, exercise is really good for that because you're gonna increase your HDL, which kind of like helps counteract some of the negative effects of that high LDL. So my HDL went up from 41 to 57, which is why my total cholesterol is about the same because my LDL went down a little bit, but my HDL also came up a little bit. So that's a really, really positive trend. 
And that's really the biggest results that we wanted to talk about. That's really all we were checking were HDL, LDL, VLDL, and triglycerides. Yeah. So, super, super cool. Super excited. Yes. Um, So, segue. Uh, I almost said segue, please, because you said drum roll. Mm -hmm. Uh, Segue is how did you do it? Yeah. So, we talked about... A bunch of different ways that you want to try and this is going to be a brief outline if you want something more in depth we have talked about maybe trying to compile some more definitive step by steps here's what you do on how to lower triglycerides improve cholesterol panels all that stuff so stay tuned for some of that hopefully we get some of that stuff posted but we want to give you a brief outline of what i did so that you can start making these changes now there's no reason you can't start literally this second that's basically what i did and as you can see, four months later, triglycerides cut more than in half, like yeah. over 50% improvement. So that's super, super cool. Yeah. And I'm going to keep making these changes. And these changes are not just, I improved it for this one blood test. I'm going to keep going with all the changes that I've made and just really implemented to my lifestyle. Well, yeah, it's all, this is the goal. It's all reversible, right? It's not like I work out for a week and then I don't need to work out ever, ever again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of diseases that are not necessarily persistent, but chronic. And something like elevated triglycerides, elevated cholesterols, even things, I just had a test on uh, in psych class about depression. Depression is a chronic illness. It can come back if you don't do what you need to do to prevent it from returning and taking steps and actions to help yourself self stay healthy. Yeah. And it's the same thing with cholesterol, same thing with diabetes. You wanna make sure that you're making these changes and implementing it so it's in your daily routine because it's just like taking your cholesterol medication every day or something. You have to make these changes and really live your life. Differently. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, So as far as what you did, let's maybe start, uh, because we talked about exercise. I think that's that's arguably the simplest thing to do. Yeah. Because there's no like, you don't have to break up with anyone to eat, you know, like you might have to do when you eat differently. Um, that's, I'm exaggerating, but maybe not for some people. Um, exercise, usually a little bit, you know, you put it on the calendar and then you just say, it's time, I'm going to go do it. So what kind of yeah. exercise did you do? So exercise, I think was the hardest and the part that I felt most disappointed in myself by because of all the symptoms that I have and exercise, unfortunately for me, certain types of exercise are really the trigger or I just feel so tired at the end of the day, or I'm having such bad numbness or muscle pain that I... I just, I don't want to work out. It makes it worse to a certain point. Yeah. So the biggest change that we had made that I could make is adding in some just really low level cardio. It doesn't have to be, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to sweat for two hours and I'm yeah. going to do sprints and work out really hard. All we did was we got a stationary bike and I tried to hop on that bike at least five times a week for at least 20 minutes. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's the only changes I made. Sometimes those 20 minutes weren't until after dinner, until like 8.30 p.m. Sometimes I would do it just, I was up studying at like 2 a.m. in the morning. So at midnight, I'd be like, well, I'm going to be up for another two hours studying. I'm going to be sitting here anyways. I'm just going to pedal really easily on this bike so I'm not just sitting and studying. So small changes, I don't necessarily recommend that. But doing something to be more active. I think the biggest change is I, after mealtime was really easy for me because that's when we're sitting here watching TV so I could hop on the bike, bike after a meal to help burn off some of those calories, uh, you know, not let the food just kind of get stored into fat, but actually use up some of the food that I had just eaten as energy. Sure. Yeah. That's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> a little, I think so. It it's a little bit sugar. like, it makes some room for what you just put in, which is kind of like slowly dripping out of your stomach into your bloodstream for a few hours after your meal. So. Yeah. It's not that. So working out after meals is not going to help your cholesterol triglycerides necessarily. It is it, good for monitoring and regulating blood sugar. So if you're someone who's struggling yeah. with blood sugar, elevated blood glucose, something like that, workouts after a meal can really help with that. And so that was kind of... Dampen the rays. Yeah. And that was my thought process with that. I have a family history of type 2 diabetes. Something with my dad is still working with. And he and I actually just had a conversation about, okay, after you eat that bowl of ice cream at night that you really, really want, just go for a walk maybe. And that could help your uh, morning blood glucose results. Yeah. 
So that was my thought process. Correct. It's not really going to help you with your cholesterol and triglycerides, but that was my thought process is, okay, well, I want to help my triglycerides. Let's also think about what else I could be getting if I'm not living a healthy lifestyle. And for me, high blood sugar is a concern moving forward. So that was a really convenient change. Just adding consistent cardio. I did try to do more lifting Lifting, than I was at the end of last year. So that was a positive change. I was doing it maybe once or twice a week. Ideally, I'm doing it three or four times a week in addition to that five times a week of cardio. And then... how long? For my lifts? Yeah. That is just depending on how I feel. So I I think ideally you're doing that for like 30 minutes to 60 minutes. Sure, ideally. Uh, As someone who has (laughs) fatigue and a really busy schedule, I would pick two exercises and just do a superset. So I would do a Romanian deadlift Mm. and a floor press. And then I would do that. And the reason I was doing only two and kind of getting away with it is because I was usually doing it with a cardio, with a bike. Yeah, same day, you mean? Mm -hmm. So I would use the bike as kind of my warm up, get my heart rate up a little bit. And I do feel better if I'm not in a full flare up. If I do cardio, I kind of have to like get over this hurdle of getting my heart rate up and feeling like maybe I'm sweating a little bit and then I feel a lot better. So I'd use the bike as my warm up, get my heart rate up, be on there 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then do a quick superset and then I'd be done. So it's not a lot. It's pretty brief, yeah. And I even played with at one point when I had just so much school and I was feeling, that was when I was feeling really sick. I couldn't tolerate more than five minutes on the bike at a time. So I only did five minutes of bike at the time. Yeah. I'd go on and then stop and go do something else and then come back and bike for a little bit, stop and do something else, come back and bike. So I was breaking up these periods of only five to 10 minutes of exercise and coming back and forth and doing as much as I could tolerate. And it doesn't take that much time out of your day. It yeah. really doesn't. If yeah. you're sitting there and watching TV, reading a book, doing on your computer, sending emails, we picked a bike specifically so I could do work on it. And it's been really good. And um, it's almost like especially later in the day or during the afternoon or whatever, it's almost like a shot of caffeine where it gives you some energy, gets your brain flowing. At least for me, it really is like that. (laughs) For you, you, I mean, you have... I'm the type of person who comes home... trauma. (laughs) (laughs) I... And I'm sure if you have a really crazy life or you have really crazy kids or something and you're, you're coming home and you're just exhausted... So I come home from school and Lance gets so mad at me, but sometimes I just have to nap. Like I- For two to three hours. Full REM cycle. Yes. (laughs) Nap. Yeah. But it's also, it has been a little bit easier this quarter because most days, mm, most days I'm done about three. Yeah, so the nap is over by six. (laughs) Most days, not all the days. On days where it's not, I do come home some days and I can't. Like Thursdays are a really good example because I still coach on Thursdays. So I'll come home from school and I don't have time to sit around. I have to coach. So I coach and then we eat and then I work out and then I do school work until I go to bed. Yeah. And then you stay up because you can't go to bed. Yeah. So that is kind of a good transition into our next. Into sleep. Sleep. Yeah. What'd you do? So as someone who's chronically sleep deprived, I did try to focus more on just small time management things, but also understanding that sleep was going to be an issue or limiting factor. I think something I did not necessarily winter quarter still. So right between our first episode and this episode, I've had a break. And that break is about a week long. From school, you mean? Yes. Yes. And so I transitioned from winter quarter, which was the hardest quarter of PA school, into spring quarter, which is also a really hard quarter of PA school just because of how burned out you feel. So the coursework is a little bit easier. You don't have as much uh, basic and general science, but it's all prepping you for clinicals, fast paced while you're there. And next week, for example, I have some type of examination every day of the week. And it's not finals week. This is just a normal week. And one of those is like, yeah, if you don't pass this test, you're not ready for clinicals. And you have to have all these meetings to prove that you are worthy of heading out onto clinicals. And it's So you don't embarrass us. Yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) I did make some more changes, I think, for sleep in the new year. Definitely a lot more in spring quarter. And so for that, it's just trying to make sure I'm setting a limit. Saying I have to get sleep tonight. I cannot pull an all-nighter. 
what can I be doing earlier in the week to prepare for this, being a little bit more mindful about what the next couple of weeks look like instead of trying to just scramble day to day to figure stuff out. And then I've been more consistent, and I think part of this is just springtime, but I've been more consistent with sleep schedule. So if I wake up at the same time every day, this is something Lance harps on and on about all the time, and I think it's really annoying because I like to sleep. But if you wake up at the same time every day, it's a lot easier to do what you need to do. And there's truth to that. It's a I lot don't, easier to wake up. I don't like to admit it because <laughs> I like to sleep in and I'm a tired person. But I think waking up consistently before 8 a.m. almost every day has helped me a lot. Yeah. And I think that's another positive change because I get a lot more done in the morning and then I'm able to go to sleep a little bit earlier. So. And, and I mean, maybe you don't see it this way, but I feel like you've maybe embraced the nap time a little bit more and it's a little more well. regular because there will be days where she's studying until two in the morning, three in the morning. And it's just like, she's test at seven, test at 7 AM. Yeah. Uh, so you gotta, you gotta sleep sometime. Yeah. And so usually it's after, you know, you do that little mini four hour nap, take your test, do whatever else you got to do at school come home and just zonk out for the other half of your sleep cycle. Yeah. You know? If you have time to take a nap, naps are okay. Some people yeah. are like, no, I, I don't want to nap. But if you have time to take a nap and you're feeling tired, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Your body is tired for a reason and it's okay to listen to it and yeah. to let yourself sleep. Yeah. And I think that is also a good segue into mindfulness. So I've always, within the past couple of years, at least I should say, not always, definitely not always, I've really focused on mindfulness and something that was really cool and fun for me was also in the winter quarter, uh, the PA school that I go to, my uh, faculty advisor, actually Dr. Hoover, she's amazing. Um, she organizes a whole curriculum for PA students about mindfulness and how to think about what your body's going through and to try to take those skills as a medical provider and how to implement them into your practice, not only for patients, but for yourself. because burnout among healthcare workers, especially now. Yeah. Yeah. With COVID is so, so astronomical. The amount of health people who are, there's a mass exodus from healthcare, not people think it's because they're forcing healthcare workers to get vaccines. It's really not the, the case. A lot of healthcare workers are fully vaccinated and just leaving because they are understaffed, overworked, underpaid, and they're not treated well by patients and patient families a lot of the time, especially yeah. with COVID issues. And I can't imagine how frustrating a lot of them feel about how they've been treated, even with my friends who work in healthcare. Some of the stories that I hear, my mouth just drops because I, it's so unreasonable what's happening to them. So I totally understand why people are unhappy. And so they try to give us these skills before we go out into clinical on how to deal with this stressful lifestyle that we've all picked to try to help people even just so that we can provide the best patient care to another patient. And the example that they give is if you have to walk into the room and basically give someone a death sentence because you just got some really bad test results back from them, you have stage four pancreatic cancer, that is something a lot of people don't do well with. And so you have to offer this diagnosis and then turn around and walk right into another room. You don't have time to go and sit and process that this patient that you might have been working with for 15 years is going to die. And you have to be able to process that and go into the room and have just a clear mind to help this other patient. And so mindfulness is a really good way for providers to practice that. Yeah. So we have this whole curriculum that Dr. Hoover and the other faculty members at Midwestern have created, and it's amazing. And this year I am on our student government as the health and wellness chair. And I was grateful and lucky enough where myself and some of the other students were allowed to kind of participate in the structure of it this year and do lunch and learns and different things to help educate our classmates on mindfulness or tools about mindfulness. So I like to teach people buteco breathing just because it's really easy to implement. Yeah. And if you don't know what that is, it's just basically a breathing style that you use that is known to activate your parasympathetic nervous system. So it slows down your heart rate. It slows down your breathing. So in moments of high anxiety, like before you go into a test. Um, I like to use it at night if I'm having one of those nights where I have a lot of anxiety and it's keeping me awake. If I do five minutes uninterrupted of buteco breathing, I'm pretty much asleep within the next 10 minutes. So it's really good to use yeah. then. And using those tools and stuff and just 
being aware of what am I doing right now for my body? Am I making the best decision for my health? And just being more mindful about what food am I eating? Did I eat today? How is my body feeling? How much water have I had today? Trying to be aware of what my body is telling me and be aware of what my stress levels are. And so I think mindfulness is really important. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned your food and nutrition and stuff. What changed about that? I do want to talk about one more thing before I talk about food. Okay. I just thought of it. Um, one of the mindfulness things that I did was before our test, uh, before I started this kind of journey to lower my triglycerides, I would sit there and I would cram and study and study and study. And now what I've been doing before my test, unless it's like first thing in the morning, 7 a.m. test when I'm just driving to school, I put my books away about 20 to 15 minutes before the test. And I put my headphones in and I pick a song or even just like the noise canceling and I go for a walk. And I just don't think about the test. I look at my surroundings. It's been really nice in Arizona. I'm not gonna be able to do this anymore because it's too hot. But I was going for walks outside and just like looking at the trees and looking at the sky and just walking yeah. really casually. And people probably thought I looked insane just cause I'm like, here's space this loopy cadet. girl, yeah, space cadet <laughs> walking down the sidewalk, like having a good time. But I think that really helped just with stress and anxiety about the testing. But also, it was a really good way to get myself moving before I would go and sit down for an hour-long test and I've been sitting while studying. So it was a good way to break out my time and just have some mindfulness and, and pay attention to what was going on around me instead of being so focused on this material that I'm about to be tested on. Yeah. And I think that was good for my test taking and my overall mental wellness and physical wellness. But yeah, food. So food is probably where I made the most successful changes. Yeah. Um, the biggest change that I think I made was just eating better. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that mean? Um, some of the stuff that I was doing, and I don't like to talk about it very much because Lance is a little judgmental about it, but that's okay. A little bit. Um, it's just because he's really good at staying strict, and he's he has this skill that I'm jealous of where... It's called masochism. Okay. <laughs> where... <laughs> He's like, that is not healthy, so I'm not going to eat it. And I'm like, but it's a donut. And he's like, but it's not going to help me, therefore I don't want it. And I'm like, but it tastes... you say, but it's breakfast. Yeah, but it's delicious, (laughs) and I want it, and I'm craving it, so I want it. And so I struggle with that a lot, but he's really good at just kind of putting that down and being like, no, it's not good for me. Like, my favorite example, I, if you know me, I really like soda. That's one thing I've not really been able to give up and Lance at like 17 went to a doctor's appointment and they said yeah soda's not very good for you and he said okay and he hasn't had it ever since (laughs) (laughs) what (laughs) how do you do that like oh I didn't know that it was so bad my parents didn't tell me yeah so he just stopped and never had it again and I (laughs) he like I've not been able to do that to be fair Dr. Harper (laughs) to be fair Dr. Harper looked at me and he was like, uh, is there any way you can make that just like one can a day? And I appreciate what he was trying to do, but I was just like, well, it's bad. So I'll stop. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, crazy. Done. Insane. No one does that. So he just stopped. Um, but I, I yeah. like things that are convenient. I like things that taste good and. We even fight over if I'm cooking, I use three times the amount of dishware that he the uses to cook. The opposite of convenience. Because it tastes better if I do it. Oh my God. I think that's the real reason we order out so much. Because if she cooks, I got a lot more dishes to do. <laughs> and if I cook, it's too bland. <laughs> so she doesn't just like salt. It's not sufficient. Salt and burnt kale. <laughs> Salt, like Lance's burnt staple. kale, yeah, and pepper. 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 <laughs> so, food changes. Yes. Something that was really convenient for me was the only restaurant that's like across the street from Midwestern is a Del Taco, which in reality is all of my favorite things because it's tacos and french fries, which are like my favorite things in the world. And it was just there and it was convenient. And if I only have 30 minutes for lunch because I spent most of my lunch time in meetings and I didn't have time to pack a lunch, I would just run to Del Taco and grab food. Yeah. So I stopped that this quarter and most of last quarter. I think I can count 
on one hand in the past however many days that this year has been, how many times I've been to Del Taco. Whereas before I was maybe going once every one to two weeks. So that's a lot better. And big deal. that was big. Yeah. And something else I was doing it. There's a McDonald's. that's not too far from school. So I'd wake up and I'd have, I'd been up until 4am studying, got two hours of sleep, got to school for a test. I'm starving. I'm hungry. I'm stressed. I'm underslept. I would just go to McDonald's and get like a breakfast sandwich and a hash brown and an orange juice. And I'd eat that. But there's so much fat and oil in that food. It's, so much. Yeah, it's so high calorie. It's so, so low much. nutrition. She felt so bad about that that she didn't tell me. Yeah, like embarrassed <laughs> about it. That's like by definition binge eating, you know. Uh, so that was a thing. So, so I stopped doing that. different, yeah. yeah. Big changes. And things that I did to replace that. So one, packing out food in boxes in advance. I think was pretty big. You made your for table lunch. for the week too, which we didn't really stick with, but I think Not it helped. All, yeah. to, I mean, you did the first one and we did it. Um, but I don't know, just kind of made you, it goes back to the mindfulness thing, but you had to think about what you were going to eat. You had to think about breakfast now. Yeah. When which it's normally you just skip and then have doubled the dinner. Yeah. So breakfast, that was really easy for me. I just bought yeah. a bushel of bananas on Sunday at our grocery trip. Tried to make sure there were five to six bananas on there. And now I just grab a banana out the door. Um, you could do toast and peanut butter. You could do overnight oats. If you have time to make a smoothie, that's what I'll do because I can get my fruits and vegetables in there. And just thinking about, I think a big change for me is for breakfast, I think where did this food come from? And if it didn't just come from the ground or a plant or something, I'm probably not eating it for breakfast. So you're not eating meat, you're saying? Uh, not necessarily meat, but just real food, not something out of a package. So like I'm not grabbing a granola bar, even though that's not a bad option. If you need something really fast and your fruit's not keeping or you don't have access to it because you live in a food desert, like I don't know. A packaged food is not so bad, especially if you're getting a good protein bar, but I'm not eating like a chewy yeah, granola bar. Yeah, that's what I was something. thinking of. Yeah, those are just sugar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or something that's like deep fried, like a bucket of hash browns and bacon. Like I'm not doing that anymore. So I think that's been really positive. Yeah. Um, making sure I'm eating breakfast was also a big one because we had talked about this a little bit in our last video. What I tend to do is I just don't eat breakfast because I don't have time. And then I just don't eat lunch because I didn't pack it. And then I come home and then I just pig out whatever I can eat, I eat. And then I eat these massive dinners that are so much high in calorie and dense foods. And because I'm eating so much. And so fast. Um, your body doesn't, that's not how energy works. Your body's not using all that energy then. It's storing it anything that you're not and it's the end of the day so i'm going to sleep like my body's not building muscle i had an exercise that day so your body's just like okay well we have all these calories now and you ate this big meal like we have to store this somewhere yeah and so it's probably going to store it as fat well and you balance that out when you mobilize when you fast for the rest of the day yeah but Somewhat, then you just have but weird peaks in cortisol and blood sugar and it does yeah and that's the biggest reason that i don't do it is because you get the hormonal peaks and dysregulated and you your body just doesn't know where it is can't, yeah can't predict what's going on so i think i really think that helped me a lot and then just trying to eat more vegetables and that is something that it's not hard to do. I just don't enjoy a lot of vegetables. So I was trying to be mindful about eating more vegetables that I do like and cooking them myself. Uh, AKA I'm not cooking them. Yeah. So our oven here is a little bit different and it tends to what we did in California a lot with our oven there, we would roast kale and I loved it and it was so good. And here it just burns so quickly. Brussels sprouts, kale, anything that we make kind of leafy, mm -hmm. it burns it so quickly here and if it's either undercooked or burned there's we haven't been able to figure yeah, out that the, middle ground the electric oven is just tough because it's so slow to heat up here yeah and so it's i don't we just haven't really figured that out if i stir the brussels sprouts or stir the kale every five minutes while we're baking it then it's better it doesn't burn quite as much and it's cooked a little bit nicer but i don't have time to do that 
So <laughs> yeah, study. Yeah. Yeah. So just being mindful about that and like, okay, I'm probably not going to eat it if we do it this way. So maybe I'll do the Brussels sprouts in a Dutch oven or something and saute it on the stovetop or cooking it a little bit differently, steaming yeah. more stuff. So like, I love beets. I don't like broccoli or cauliflower as much. So we haven't been doing a ton of that. Carrots, love carrots, eat them all the time. So just picking foods that I know that I like more, even if it is a little bit more consistent, Lance is very supportive and it's like, yeah, if you'll eat it, get that. And so. I'm not picky. So it's, I have a lot of like dietary restrictions, but we can usually find some overlap and it's fine. Yeah. And so just really finding foods. And we had a doctor say this once, you know, if you're struggling with your diet, try a bunch of stuff, see what you like, and then don't buy stuff that you don't like just because you think it's healthy buy something that you're gonna eat and that you enjoy eating so that you continue to eat it instead of those people who are like well i'm gonna buy a salad because it's healthy and then they eat half their salad throw it away because they don't actually enjoy it and then they order a pizza like that's not the goal the goal is to eat foods that you enjoy that taste good and that help you get full because a lot of people they complain you know i'm eating healthy but i'm not feeling full okay add something that's still healthy to help you make you full it's not yeah yeah that's and that's kind of like for me i'll i'll eat a lot um but i'll eat a lot of vegetables and that'll Mm -hmm. get me to start getting full the other thing i wanted to say about you skipping breakfast and the and and lunch is you you'll just the binging for dinner makes you eat so fast that you override any signals of being yeah. full and so you end up overeating even though you skipped meals it's just so easy to do and you crave <clears throat> foods when you do that to your body like when you're fasting all the time and you're not listening to your signals when you're hungry yeah. and your cortisol's elevated because you're not sleeping well and now you're not eating consistently your blood sugar is messed up your body's gonna crave sugary fatty foods that's just natural that's part of the way our bodies work, especially once you're exposed to it. Yeah. That's what your body's going to yeah. crave in those moments of stress. It learns is... that they're an option, and then it says these are high calories. So evolution has told our bodies to seek those things out. Yeah. So yeah. don't <laughs> don't do those things. <laughs> <laughs> so those were big changes for you. Were... And they is were successful. Uh, those were the main points that I thought of before this so the only other thing i want to ask you about um complications but before we talk about whatever else came up that made this hard for you the last piece of diet is did we order out dinner oh we did a ton a ton a ton how much do you think at least four times a week for dinner you're saying so that means you're not counting if you ordered out lunch while you were away from me is that true yes i'm trying to get an accurate number because we probably do order dinner through four probably not five but maybe five probably Um, about four times a week for dinner yeah during the week um maybe once or twice for lunch but not always so this week i think i only ordered out for lunch once So that is something to consider for sure. Um, I think that eating out is often associated with being unhealthy because it's really, it's really hard to know what is in your food when somebody else makes it. And it's really easy to maybe kind of know, but ignore it. Um, so, you know, it, you might have the same meal at home and, out at a restaurant but it tastes so much better at the restaurant you can't figure out why well it's because they put a lot more calories in it to make it taste better (laughs) they fry it in you know hot oil or something like that and those will that's gonna transfigure your fats and it clogs stuff up that was a big one um just being mindful about okay what do i eat when we order out french fries are my favorite food if i had to eat one food for the rest of my life it'd probably be french fries i cut that back so much yeah so cutting back the foods that we were ordering was a big change. Like we still, I got, I switched from Del Taco to Chipotle at school because there's a Chipotle that's not too far. And it's not necessarily like, oh my God, Chipotle is so healthy. It's just not French fries and quite as fried as yeah. it is at Del Taco. It's like grilled food, not. Yeah. 
and I wasn't fried. getting like <laughs> burritos and bowls and stuff that have so many calories. My trick for Chipotle is one, either get a salad and don't get tons of toppings or uh, tacos because tacos, you get a much smaller portion and I figured this out because tacos were the only thing I was getting from Chipotle that weren't making me tired after I ate yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, if you're getting tired after you're eating all your meals, that's not a good sign. That's a, <laughs> Your caloric intake is probably too high. Probably, or you're just, your body doesn't agree with those foods either. Yeah. Or both, you know. Yeah. So, making those changes and just being mindful, like, if we're ordering out, we have a burger place around here, and I love cheeseburgers, too. And so, I didn't stop the cheeseburger necessarily, but instead of getting a large side of fries or something, we were getting a salad. And we still got small fries. And the salad's Sometimes not like... Sometimes we still get fries, yeah. Super <laughs> healthy. The salad's like a chopped salad with like hard a boiled egg and like some crumbled blue cheese. Blue cheese. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I think it's like a ranch dressing. It's really rich. That, that and pizza are probably like our worst things that we'll order out. Yeah. Um, we don't... I don't think we ordered pizza more than once a week. Uh, and with maybe a couple exceptions, but we were oh, pretty pizza. good about that. Yeah. And burgers, like we didn't, we might have done that the same week we did a pizza thing, but we didn't do it more than once. So that's two meals out of the week that, you know, the point is we're still trying to be really good. Like our breakfasts and our lunches are still quite good, quite healthy, nutritious, lower calorie. Yeah. Um, so having you know ordering out for dinner because we're both tired doesn't you know break us yeah and even my lunches it's not necessarily a lunch but i'll pack boxes of basically just snacks i'll cut up some fruit and put in a box of fruit and then a box of vegetables like carrots on one side and maybe like a small amount of tortilla chips or something and then a box of strawberries and blueberries and raspberries and whatever fruit we have watermelon and then you know, I have all these plans, like, I'm going to make all these wraps and do all this really great stuff. And I just, it's not time conducive to do that every morning. It doesn't That's happen. I'm saying. All the dishes. So, just making something really simple that yeah. doesn't sound like a full meal. It's not a full lunch. Yeah. I felt fine after eating it, and I was not hungry throughout the day. Yeah. So, you figure out what works for you. Not everyone's going to have the same reaction to me, but... Sure. And, you know, you know not everyone is... A psycho or finds that psycho thing that I do where you're just, this Impossible. is good for me, so I'm going to eat it. Like, I, I don't, I never recommend that to people, though I think it's much easier if you're the type of person who will say that. Um, it's just, it's not feasible to start there, you know? Yeah. It's very difficult. I've been trying for almost, I don't know how long we've been together, six years? <laughs> Something like that? Yeah. Almost six years? Yeah. It's contagious. Yeah, it's Obesity not. is contagious. It's just because of the lifestyle. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Oh, I did cut back on my soda, too. Okay, yeah. I did do yeah. that. Um, I limited it to... Caffeine helps me with uh, headaches and migraines that I get. Yeah. So I really tried... Coke is just really easy, and it's not as much caffeine as I was getting in coffee. And we found out something that triggers a lot of my symptoms is caffeine, so... I'm super sensitive to it. And so just cutting back on caffeine in yeah. general has been really big for me. Yeah. But soda specifically because that was my primary source of caffeine. Yeah, especially being anxiety prone and, you know, bladder problems when you're test taking. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like it's an hour long test and I have to pee. I peed right before, but I still have to pee now. Yeah, that's yeah. the nervous bladder. Yeah, you, I mean don't want that so if you're prone to that avoid that um and maybe the uh the theme here is it's not necessarily i wanted allison to tell her story because i think it's a good example that you can do stuff it's way easier for her i mean she's in school but she doesn't have a family and i'm very supportive with this so it's not like i need to change my lifestyle as well so this could be a much more difficult situation um, but you don't need to necessarily do everything that she does. Take the lesson about uh, working out, for example. It's like, uh, you know, I've got 20 minutes. Maybe, you know, for you, 
uh, busy work day, you got home at seven, you had dinner, kids went down for bed at maybe 8.30, maybe, maybe just bike for half an hour, kind of slowly, because that is what you can do today. There were days my heart rate didn't get above 100 on the bike. Yeah. Like you just, it's movement. You yeah. just got to do something. Yeah. And it I doesn't have to be intense. Creating that habit is, and sticking to that habit, even if you don't feel really good, is super important because then if, once you get past that, your, your mind just breaks and there's no coming back. Yeah. That's, I think we're in a unique position because we both have that coaching background. So if I'm not just being stubborn, like I know what to do yeah. to help myself. But there are days I'm just, I don't want to do it. Yeah. And I am lucky where I have Lance to help me. And he doesn't come in and be like, did you bike today? But sometimes I tell him, I'm feeling really unmotivated today. Can you help me get motivated for this or something? Like I'm struggling to to want to do this and he can help me there. Or I'm struggling to want to eat well tonight. I want to eat well. Emotionally, I don't want to. I need you to keep me accountable and not let me order out tonight. And he says, okay. Or, um, I don't want to cook. How about we order out if you work out right now? Because, you know, we've run out of time. Yeah. We've either got to spend this hour cooking or we got to spend this hour working out. Yeah. And so at that point, it's like, okay, I'll work out with you because we're going to order out now. <laughs> yeah. So he'll do a second workout or something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I know we're getting, this is getting pretty long and we're losing daylight, but do you want to talk briefly about complications in your life and with school unexpected all-nighters unexpected sicknesses yeah or is that too long and should we save it no i mean we can talk about it i don't i think and i was talking about this with a professor today actually because she was asking me how i was doing because the faculty's aware that i've been having health problems because it you know i've had to miss some classes and do some stuff to see doctors and whatnot but uh, she asked, how are you doing? And so I kind of went through my whole spiel about everything that's happened and what, what we're working towards and some things that have been giving me a hard time with schoolwork. And, you know, it's hard to do a venous puncture on my classmate when I can't hold the needle. So there's things that have been frustrating. But she looked at me and she's like, I don't know how you're doing this. And I was like, you just do it. Like, I'm, I'm not the only student in my program who's having health issues. I know at least three of my other classmates that I'm very close with are having health issues. Like, everyone has something, and I think it goes back to that colloquial phrase, you know, you never know what someone's going through, and it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone has issues. Everyone has drama. And I was just talking to a friend earlier today. It's not fair to yourself to compare your situation to mine. Yeah. And just because you're like, well, your life sounds so hard. I could never do what you're doing. That's not true. And it's not fair to yourself to say, I can't do that. Yeah. You're going through stuff that, you know, maybe I wouldn't be able to go through. And we all just take what we're given and work through it. So, you know, making sure that you're not comparing yourself to my story, I think is really important. Yeah. But, you know, I have had a lot of issues physically. I've had some family members who have been really sick and that's been really challenging, you know, just getting phone calls or texts late at night, right before I'm going to go to bed that says, you know, this person just took a turn for the worst and thinking that person's not going to make it through the night, things like that, you know, that's affected sleep. It's affected my mental health. It's affected my motivation. You know, when you're feeling upset about something, you don't want to work out. You don't want to eat well. You just want to sit around and watch a movie or dissociate or do something else. And so, so what do you do? I talk to you or cry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And that's like probably topic for another video of like, how do you handle these mental health issues? And answer number one is find a really good therapist. Um, But you got to kind of take and listen to your body. So my symptoms are very physical and they affect what I can do physically. So what do I need to do? to mitigate the the pain that i'm getting in my arms and my legs is exercise going to help that right now no and i'm in a position where i've had this for so long i know kind of what helps me now and so i know things like rest i know eating well really helps and i know some if the symptoms aren't really bad some level of low movement helps so i've used that to think and i tell my clients this because that's the client population i work with as well but You kind of just got to push through that boundary. You got to find the internal drive to pull yourself up off the couch and say, I'm going to do this today. If your body is really telling you no, though, listen to it. Yeah. 
because then you're not going to get burned out. Like if I had pushed through some of the days where I'm feeling really crappy, yeah, you would burn out so hard. I, I'd be out for oh, weeks. Man. And so I have to recognize that today yeah. is a day my body is telling me to rest. Yeah. So I'm going to rest. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to do, I'm going to control the things that I can control. Yeah. I'm going to make sure I don't order five guys or whatever. I'm not going to, uh, overload on caffeine to push through and focus on this thing. Right. I'm going to take the day to rest. I'm going to do what's good to my body. I'm going to drink a lot of water and I'm going to hit tomorrow running. Like I'm yeah. going to focus on what yeah. I need to today to recover. And then I'm going to tackle tomorrow and, and get where I need to be. And I'm not going to, well, I still do, I still do feel guilty. And I think that's something a lot of people with chronic illness feel. And it doesn't matter what that chronic illness is. It doesn't have to be invisible or really extreme. Uh, even just depression. I hear that from people all the time. It's like, I feel so guilty that I'm not doing these things or I'm not doing enough. I should be doing more to get better. And it's like, no, like you're, you're physically sick right now. Like, yeah. Listen to your body and do what you need to do to take care of your body. And thankfully exercise and good diet are things that help you there. So just think about that kind of, if you're struggling with, with health issues, whether it's pain or, digestive issues or sleep issues all this stuff is going to be improved with with lifestyle and that lifestyle is diet and exercise yeah yeah get creative um but the other specific example for her is like if she's feeling sick and she wants to lift weights well we can compromise and just ride the bike really easily and then you're still working out like it still counts if you don't do a workout that's 60 minutes long and leaves you wanting to vomit yeah. after like not everything has to be like that i haven't worked out like that in years yeah. and that's okay yeah. uh it's something i struggle with because i liked those workouts mm -hmm. and with weights too if I'm feeling good, this is uh, the best example I can give. And Lance is like, some of that's kind of normal, but some of it I think is kind of messed up. I can lift 40, 45 pounds if I'm feeling really good for a bench press. On a day where I'm feeling really tired, I can barely do 20s. And that is like part of my symptoms and issues. Like that's just a muscle strength issue. And so when you look at all the neurological system, symptoms I'm having, it makes sense. Uh, but it's so frustrating and discouraging and those days i feel horrible so maybe i do some work with bands or something because yeah. it's a little bit less resistance and then i don't feel so bad about myself or yeah. maybe i try to increase the reps as much as i can but there's there's changes like that and that is a mental health talk more so than anything and maybe yeah. we'll do another video on that but that's just dealing with chronic illness but you can still make changes if you're having these issues have a busy lifestyle if you have a crazy job you have crazy kids you have health issues you can make small changes that will help you improve and keep in mind i'm young and this is new for me like i haven't had high tri triglycerides for years so me cutting it in half in a month or three or four months is i'm super excited about it it's super cool because i feel like i did an experiment on myself but you may not see results quite like that and that's okay but something we didn't talk about that I really wanted to emphasize sure. is uh, cutting out alcohol. So we don't drink. Yeah. But alcohol, oh, don't drink it. It's poison. It's mm. literal poison for your body. Like, that's what a hangover is. It's literally like your body recovering mm. from you poisoning yourself. So that's a different story kind of. But alcohol will elevate your triglycerides. It's like one of the number one things. Um, if you drink alcohol even a week before your triglycerides exam, your triglycerides are gonna be elevated. It's how the alcohol is processed through your liver and how triglycerides are packaged in your body, the pathways. Um, it's just so bad for you. So if you're trying to lower your triglycerides or you have someone or a family history of high cholesterol and high triglycerides and you're at risk for heart disease, stop drinking alcohol. The antioxidants that you get from your one glass a week or whatever of red wine is, no, get it from eating blueberries. You don't need it from the red wine. Like stop drinking alcohol, just don't do it. It's gonna make your blood results a lot worse. And you're gonna see, I've had people lose weight, improve sleep apnea, you know, cut down their triglycerides just from stopping and drinking alcohol without making any other changes. So really consider that if you're someone who's struggling. Yeah. If you drink alcohol, you're trying to get improvements on your blood panels, just cut out the alcohol and see how much better it gets. I guarantee you, you'll have improvements. You know, it is a huge deal and it's very closely tied to some people's identities, so it's tough. But I would highly recommend avoiding it if you see it as a possibility. Yeah, that's fair.
Is that's there... the one thing I've been able to be like, oh, it's not good for me. I'm going to stop doing that. Yeah, yeah. And again, I mean, it makes it easier for her because I haven't, I don't drink, never have drunk. So it's like, it's not around all the time. Yeah. It's not something you constantly have to push away. And that, you know, it makes it tougher. Yeah. Um, you know, and I don't have the bad food in the house. <laughs> I've had, I've had wine occasionally with him, but it's like a dinner and I'll have a glass. Yeah. And Four that's times. like a year. <laughs> Ever. Oh, ever. Maybe. <laughs> That's probably accurate. Yeah. I feel like I can recall them all. That's funny. Me too. <laughs> Three or four times. Anything else you want to say about alcohol? Uh, not alcohol. Any no. parting thoughts for the viewers? Since our, our screen's getting a little dark. It there. is getting gotta... dark. <laughs> um, if you have questions, reach out, post a comment. Uh, maybe we'll do some videos that break things down a little bit further and give you a routine yeah. to follow if you think that will be helpful. And, you know, just listen to your body and do what works for you and see where you get. Yeah, I did these on my own. I didn't need to go to a doctor to order these blood tests. Yeah. I just got my first blood test from a doctor, and they were like, oh, you should come back in for another appointment. And I was like, no, I know what to do. Yeah. So I just did it and then reordered my labs myself. You can do that through LabCorp, Quest. Most of the time they have options for you to order your own tests. That's what I did. Came back in about three, four months is about where you want to follow up if you've made changes consistently to see if it's gotten better. Because that's when you'll start to see improvements with yeah. if you're checking a A1C uh cholesterol panel triglycerides stuff like that you'll see changes within three to four months most likely yeah if you're trending in the right direction yeah um we wish you well thanks for watching if you learned something hit the like button and subscribe to be notified when we release new videos if you really do want a deeper dive into some of this stuff i know we gave you a lot of actionable stuff this whole time uh but if you need it broken down more leave a comment below because Otherwise, I'm probably not going to prioritize it. But if I know that's what you want, then maybe I will. If you need something else to watch, how about uh, we start with just total body flexibility. I'll leave a, uh, a circuit up here. Thanks, guys. <laughs>